This video is brought to you by Filmmaker U. Learn filmmaking techniques from some of the brightest minds in the industry like Mad Max colorist Eric Whipp, Oscar-winning sound designer Eugene Geerty, and Emmy award-winning editor Brian Cates. For more info or to enroll, check out FilmmakerU.com. Visual effects started early in the film industry, real early. In 1898, J. Stuart Blackton and Albert E. Smith began using a new effect for the now lost Humpty Dumpty Circus. The process was simple. Set up some toy dolls, expose the image onto a single frame of film, move the doll slightly, expose, and repeat over and over. The idea was to create the illusion of motion. In the process, stop motion was born. This technique would come up again in the work of Georges Méliès. In his shorts like The Black Imp and Going to Bed Under Difficult Circumstances in which a man attempting to undress her bed continually has his clothing appear on him. Eventually, Willis O'Brien would further develop the technique in his work on The Lost World and 1933's King Kong. What originally started as a way of making short, animated pieces quickly grew into a viable way of making the impossible possible. O'Brien's protege, Ray Harryhausen, continued to work as an animator creating some of the most important stop-motion work to that point. Most notably, Clash of the Titans and the legendary Jason and the Argonauts skeleton sequence. Stop motion wasn't just turning heads at the box office. It also became an effective way to create television programming, especially for children. In the US, Rankin Bass Productions capitalized on the previous success of programming like The Gumby and Pokey Show by creating holiday themed specials such as Santa Claus is Coming to Town, Little Drummer Boy, and most famously, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. It was also used in the UK by animator Nick Park to help build Ardman. Originally developing short content for the BBC, the company quickly took off with the creation of characters like Wallace and Gromit, Shaun the Sheep, and eventually full-length feature films such as Chicken Run and the animated feature Flushed Away thanks to a contract with DreamWorks. Despite stop motion's success, it did have a fatal flaw. It lacked an emotion blur. This gave everything a staccato, jumpy effect, lacking the typical blurring present when an action was taken in most films. To combat this, Phil Tippett, an animator at Industrial Light & Magic, revived an old technique using a glass sheet and petroleum jelly. While time-consuming, by moving the glass sheets coated in jelly slowly following the actions depicted on screen, it created a more natural and lifelike movement in the stop motion. The technique, called Go Motion, was used in 1980's The Empire Strikes Back. Despite the popularity of stop motion in television and its modernization with go motion, its use in movies began to wane. Audiences were becoming more sophisticated visually, and as a result, expecting better effects. As computer animation began to become a possibility in the 90s, it seemed that stop motion's days were done. That is until pre-production began on Steven Spielberg's next blockbuster, Jurassic Park. Originally planned to be done entirely using Go Motion, the Raptors in the Kitchen sequence in Jurassic Park wasn't convincing enough for Steven Spielberg. I come home with my kids and look at the stuff over and over and over again, and my kids bought it. They said, wow, Dad, a real dinosaur. The movement was very accurate and very rhythmical, but there was still something a bit Go Motion-y about it. And, and that's when Dennis Murin came to me with this idea to show me a test. After Industrial Light & Magic had used computer graphics to such great effect in Terminator 2, the team decided to come up with a solution to Spielberg's concerns, mixing the fluid motion of puppets with the lifelike capabilities of CGI. After weeks of tests and practice, ILM developed what are essentially robotic puppets. This allowed the puppeteers to manipulate the movements of the dinosaurs while giving the animators a rough idea of where the raptor's limbs should be in 3D space. The movements of the specialized puppets would generate the tracking data that was then applied to the 3D models of the dinosaurs. If any of the data fell wrong, the computer animation team could then manipulate the tracking data to help smooth the motion of the dinos. 
The process used here was the infancy of modern motion capture, a technology that has become vital in modern blockbusters. It's an effect that can be seen in two of the highest grossing films of all time, Avengers Endgame and Avatar. However, it hadn't really been used prior to Star Wars, The Phantom Menace. That's right, love him or hate him, Jar Jar Binks is the first ever completely motion capture character on film. Ah. Your support is well seen. Actor Ahmed Best would perform alongside the rest of the cast with a Jar Jar prosthetic head on top of his to provide eyeline for the actors. Then, in post-production, he would redo his performance in a controlled studio environment, capturing the raw tracking data. Phantom Menace might be the first, but the film that really cemented motion capture as a vital part of modern filmmaking came along two years later. Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. Must have the precious. They stole it from us. Sneaky little orbitses. Originally, the team at Weta Digital were struggling to get a believable design out of Gollum. The proportions of his limbs frequently looked either unrealistically cartoonish or too human to feel like a fantasy creature. This was especially true for the face. It was difficult for any emotion to come from the character due to the complex amount of fine muscle movement needed to be performed by the animators, especially around the mouth and eyes. After a lot of experimentation and tweaking, the production realized that by basing the face of the character on that of actor Andy Serkis, they would get a more believable creature. Despite being more realistic, it was still a tremendous amount of work. Just like Ahmed Best did for Jar Jar, Andy Serkis would perform the role on set, then, after principal photography wrapped, he would do it all over again on a closed stage, alone. This gave the animators the tracking data they needed to composite the character onto the film. Unlike Jar Jar, Andy's face was covered with dozens of tracking points. Because the character's face was based on Andy's, all of these points lined up with the 3D model. Not only did this help cut down on animation time, it allowed for a lifelike recreation of a fantasy creature. Since the original films were released, technology has progressed to the point where rough tracking can be done on set in real time, which is what was used when Gollum talks to Bilbo in The Hobbit. Director Peter Jackson could see a real-time, low-quality render of Gollum acting opposite Martin Freeman. After over a hundred years of use, visual effects in film continue to grow, adapt, and evolve. With motion capture being the most recent in a long line of technological improvements, it's exciting to imagine the possible ideas and needs that will force further advancements in years to come. If you enjoyed the content in this video, don't forget to check out Filmmaker U. It's a one-stop destination to learn how industry professionals approach their jobs as colorists, sound designers, or editors. Like Eric Whip, colorist for Mad Max Fury Road. With comprehensive courses available and new content coming, it's a great time to enroll at FilmmakerU.com.